Napoleon Bonaparte, born on the small island of Corsica, is one of the most famous men to have ever lived, hailed as the man of the 19th century. Even his very name is used as a word to describe something momentous, colossal, Napoleonic. A rags to riches story, Napoleon was only 24 years old when he became a general, and 35 when he crowned himself Emperor of the French. Charismatic leader of men, shrewd politician, and a military genius, Napoleon fought 60 battles in his career and only lost seven of them, making him the most victorious general in history. Not since the days of ancient Rome and the Caesars had one man conquered so much of Europe or held so much power. As a ruler of France and its empire for nearly 15 years, Napoleon was also a reformer and improver. He played a leading role in solidifying the gains and ideals of the French Revolution, promoting equality and careers open to talent, securing religious freedom and tolerance, ending aristocratic and feudal privilege, and founding the Civil Code, a unified and progressive code of laws, which are still in use across Europe to this day. Napoleon's empire helped provide the basis of what is today the European Union. For this reason, Napoleon is often considered the father of modern Europe, and ever since him, the world was never really the same. To this day, Napoleon remains one of the most written about men in history, second only to Jesus Christ. Inspiring masterpieces of music, art, literature and poetry, from Beethoven's stirring third symphony to Tolstoy's War and Peace, few fictional characters have ever done as much as Napoleon Bonaparte. The so-called man of destiny and a mass of contradictions, Napoleon is still something of an enigma, both a hopeless romantic idealist and the bitterest of cynics. The combination of his irresistible charm when he chose to deploy it, his iron will, workaholic habits, inspirational speeches and sayings, sheer intellect and of course his fiery temperament, captivated or alarmed. To some he was a god, to others the Antichrist. And his meteoric rise and then crushing downfall has been compared to a Greek tragedy. After less than 15 years in power, in the last of seven wars formed against him by coalitions of European monarchs, Napoleon was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo and exiled to the remote rocky island of St. Helena in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. At the end of his life, reflecting on his misfortunes, Napoleon's analysis was, I have too much ambition and a spirit of fire. This is the story of Napoleon and the dawn of a new age. The rise of an obscure Corsican boy to the very pinnacle of fame and fortune, from soldier to statesman to emperor, has spellbound generation after generation. After trying and failing to keep the island of his birth, Corsica, tied to France, and after a dramatic falling out with Paoli, Napoleon and his family were now exiled from their island home. A tie to the past had been broken, and Napoleon set to work to make his fortune and future in revolutionary France, which was in a state of war. At the siege of Toulon, Napoleon would take his first step towards greatness. The Buonapartes landed in Toulon on the 14th of June 1793 as political refugees. First, they moved to the small village of La Valette near the port. Napoleon's ambition and modest salary as a captain was to pay for the fatherless family of nine, as only he had a job. Joseph did not have the necessary degree to practice law in France, Lucien had never worked, and the rest were all too young. The Tizia's children, who were all, apart from Lucien, destined to occupy thrones and become prince and princesses of France, were reduced to living on bread doled out to them daily by the municipal charity organization of Marseille. The Tizia and her daughters also had to take in sewing for extra money. Luckily, their fellow Corsican, Salicetti, used his influence to look out for them, obtaining them the small relief of a government allowance. The country to which the Buonapartes had fled was, if anything, worse off than the island they had left. 
France had a new government called the Committee of Public Safety. The most influential was Maximilien Robespierre, a bookish puritanical theorist who believed that men are naturally moral and good. What united the 12 men needing this government was a fanatical belief in republicanism, as defined by themselves, and that everything else being evil must go. According to one of Robespierre's colleagues, what constitutes the Republic is the complete destruction of everything that is opposed to it. The era saw people discarding the use of the former monsieur and addressing each other as citizen. They wore red bonnets and striped trousers rather than aristocratic knee breeches. The crowds of revolutionaries wore heavy wooden clogs or sabots that could be wielded destructively, hence the origin of the term sabotage. This footwear was so popular that a leaving revolutionary boasted, in 20 years, no one in Paris will know how to make a pair of shoes. Dechristianization was also one of the government's policies. All around France, churches were being closed, saints' names removed from the streets, clerical dress forbidden in public, and holidays like the Feast of Brutus were invented to replace Easter and Christmas. But this new anti-Christianity was welcomed by some, including Napoleon's younger brother, Lucien, who discarded his Christian name and now assumed the name of the ancient Roman Republican, Brutus. In April 1793, once it became clear that Robespierre's Jacobins had triumphed as the top political faction in the convention, General Dumouriez, the co-victor of the Battle of Valmy, and a moderate Girondin, defected to France's enemies, the Austro-Prussian coalition. Dumouriez's treachery and other crises led Robespierre to order the wholesale arrest of his political rivals, the Girondins, 22 of whose heads were cut off in the space of 36 minutes, marking the beginning of the reign of terror. For moderate republicans like Napoleon, for anyone with a good word for kings, for all who resented the committee's dictatorial and unconstitutional powers, the government showed a hatred unparalleled since the revolution began. Betraying the rights of man, they began to execute people for their political and religious opinions, often without trial and without mercy. Many Frenchmen refused to accept this new wave of terror. And in Paris, a leading radical of the day, Jean-Paul Marat, was stabbed to death in his bath. Across France, ten regions had risen up against the committee some protesting about the unlawful imprisonment of suspects, others against the soldiers' desecration of religious statues and crosses, others against the scarcity and high price of bread. The Vendée region in the west of France burst into open revolt, intent on restoring a king. With Lyon rising in favour of the royalists too, and Spanish and Piedmontese armies operating inside southern France, while Prussian and Austrian armies were on the eastern borders. Not only was France matched against most of Europe, but she was also at war with herself. The French Republic would soon declare mass conscription, in which all able-bodied men between the ages of 18 and 25 were called upon to defend the revolution and their patrie, more than doubling the size of the French army to 1.5 million men. In mid-July, renegade National Guardsmen from Marseille had seized Avignon, an important ammunition centre, and butchered 30 civilians in cold blood. Napoleon took part in General Carteau's successful assault on the town. It was a grim lesson for Napoleon in the horrors of civil war. His own troops shot and killed National Guardsmen and civilians, and in turn were killed by them. Napoleon was deeply upset by his experience at Avignon. Such atrocities made a mockery of his youthful ideals of equality and liberty. All the generous impulses of the revolution seemed to have disappeared. And only four years after it had begun, here he was, shooting down his fellow Frenchmen on behalf of the terrorist government. Depressed, Napoleon had what was in effect a nervous breakdown and went to recuperate at nearby Beaucaire. There, Napoleon wrote down his inner conflict in the form of a dialogue titled Le Souper de Beaucaire. In a fictional account of a supper at an inn, the characters are an army officer, obviously representing Napoleon, and a Marseille businessman, a moderate republican. The businessman claims that the southerners have the right to fight for their political views and condemns General Carteau as a murderer. Napoleon, while showing sympathy for the businessman's moderate views, condemns the southerners for having committed the impardonable crime of plunging France into civil war. Changes must take place legally 
not by armed rebellion, he argues. The majority of Frenchmen are behind the government, and only the regular army with its discipline and loyalty can restore order. Though personally he detests civil war, where people tear one another to pieces and kill without knowing whom they kill, Napoleon defended General Carteau as an essentially humane and honest man. In this dialogue, Napoleon justified what he was doing, but pled for an end to civil war. In this imaginary conversation, Napoleon discussed the situation so clearly that the deputies who were looking after the South, Salicetti, Gasparin, and Maximilien Robespierre's younger brother, Augustin, ordered the paper to be published at public expense and distributed it as a campaign document. They also promised to reward the author when they had the opportunity. However, Napoleon's pamphlet failed to make the impression he desired to stop the bloodshed, and civil war continued. Sickened by civil strife and purges, Napoleon wrote to the War Office, asking to be posted to the Army of the Rhine. It was France's enemies he wanted to fight, not his fellow Frenchmen. And before the month was out, Napoleon unexpectedly got his chance. The port of Toulon was France's largest and most important naval base in the south and was home to a third of the French navy. More than 50 ships of the line and frigates were anchored in its harbour. But the inhabitants of Toulon had for some time been in revolt against the government. As they were under siege and without food, the English fleet promised them provisions on condition that they let their ships enter the harbour and recognised the infant Louis XVII as their king. After days of intense debate, people of Toulon raised the white flag, spangled with the fleur-de-lis. Next day, Toulon opened its port to English and Spanish ships, and its gates to 15,000 English, Spanish and Italian troops. The capture of Toulon was a disaster for the French Navy. As bad a defeat as Trafalgar would be, in fact, because when the English entered Toulon, they were free to burn 12 French warships and towed away 9 more, without losing a single ship themselves. The treachery of the people of Toulon enraged the revolutionary government, who were determined that at all costs, Toulon must be retaken, and the English invaders driven from French soil. A few weeks after these events, Captain Bonaparte was escorting a slow-moving ammunition convoy from Marseille to Nice when he stopped by to pay his respects to Salicetti. You couldn't have come at a better moment, Salicetti said to him. He was now one of the four government commissioners responsible for the siege of Toulon, and he had a problem. The besieging French force was now without an artillery chief. Convinced that Napoleon was the man for the job, Salicetti offered him the position without even consulting the generals in command. Despite him being only 24 years old, Napoleon accepted the job on the spot. Depressed as he had been during his garrison days in Valence and frustrated as he had been in Corsica, Napoleon felt that Toulon would be an excellent opportunity for him. The man in charge of the siege and Napoleon's commanding officer was General Carteau. Carteau had previously been a court painter by profession, but he threw himself into the revolution, taught himself soldiering and was now a general at 42. This was not especially unusual at the time, since most of France's officers had been aristocrats who were now fleeing the revolution in large numbers. The French army was seriously short of professional leadership. Napoleon was rather amused by Carteau. He noticed how the painter general habitually twirled his long black moustache how he rode a magnificent horse once owned by the Prince de Condé, on which he would constantly pose as though for his portrait, and how no matter the context he kept announcing, I attack in column of three. At first, Carteau insisted that he didn't need Napoleon's help with the artillery to capture Toulon. But the next morning at dawn, he took Napoleon, who he had started referring to as the educated captain, out in his cabriolet to admire, so he said, the preparations for attack. As soon as they neared, they got out of the carriage and threw themselves down in the undergrowth to survey the area. Napoleon was astonished by how incompetently the siege was being conducted. He found that batteries of cannons had been placed that could not even reach half the distance they were designed to hit, while the cannonballs were being heated at ridiculously long distances from the guns themselves. Napoleon noticed some mounted guns and some digging which he could not account for due to their positions. Dupas, said Carteau turning to his aide-de-camp. Are those our batteries? Yes, General. And our park? There, close at hand. And our red-hot walls? In yonder houses, where two companies have been employed all morning in heating them. But how shall we be able to carry these red-hot walls? This seemed to perplex both of them, and they turned to Napoleon and asked him to explain how it could be managed. 
Napoleon was nearly tempted to take the whole thing as a joke. This was basic military knowledge, but replied that the best way to do so was with a big iron scoop. Carteau then ordered one of the cannon to be loaded as Napoleon suggested. Then he announced the imminent burning of the English fleet. Napoleon also thought this was a joke, for the English ships were at least three miles away, but Carteau was in earnest. Oughtn't we to fire a sighting round? Napoleon asked. Neither Carteau nor his staff seemed to know what it was, but they repeated approvingly, Sighting round? Yes, certainly. The cannon was loaded with an iron ball. With a flash, a roar and a cloud of smoke, the ball sped away and landed less than a mile off. It did not even reach the sea. As Napoleon well knew, the gun was simply too far away to reach its target. But he found Carteau's reaction very amusing. Those wretched aristocrats in Marseille have sent us dud gunpowder, Carteau exclaimed. Carteau then ordered a culverin, a clumsy gun with a very long barrel, to be brought into position and fired at the English ships. At the third shot, the gun blew itself up. That day, the burning of the English fleet did not take place. Despite this absurd prelude, Napoleon knew that his big chance had come, and the gravity of the situation. There were 18,000 foreign troops occupying Toulon, notably English. They had come to destroy the revolution and put Louis XVII on the throne. The longer they stayed, the more heart they would give to the ongoing regional insurrections in France, and to the anarchy which, in another way, would also destroy the revolution. A victory at Toulon could save it. And Napoleon was certain Toulon could be captured, with guns. What was in order now was a steady build-up of French firepower, notably artillery. Toulon did not require a full-blown siege on the fort, as some military and political leaders had believed. Carteau wanted to attack Toulon itself directly from the northeast, under withering fire from the English ships in the port. But Napoleon believed that they should not attack the town, but the English fleet. A close look at the map showed that the strategic key to the port is a hill called Needle Point, L'Aiguillette, lying on a cape jutting into the inner bay directly south of the port. If the French could capture L'Aiguillette, then the dozen or so other English-held forts would tumble. The French could then place their artillery and rain down a continuous fire on the English ships in the harbour, forcing them to flee the port and evacuate all their troops. Toulon would then fall by itself. However, an initial infantry attack on L'Aiguillette had already been tried and had been repulsed, after which the English had built a fort to protect the point called Fort Mulgrave. The fort was so strong and well protected that the French nicknamed it Little Gibraltar. In order to capture it, Napoleon would have to remove several solidly defended positions held by the English, one after the other. His strategy called for the French forces to dig in and launch a long-term artillery barrage. Only after the English fortifications were severely weakened could the French launch an infantry attack, coordinated, sustained, and inevitably costly. When Napoleon told him that the fate of Toulon depended on the capture of Fort Mulgrave, Carteau retorted, Young man, I see that you are ignorant of geography. Napoleon simply could not get Carteau to appreciate the vital role of guns in the coming conflict. One day he asked Napoleon to establish a battery, with the rear of the gun so close against the front of a house that it left no room for the gun to recoil as it fired. Another time, after returning from the morning parade, he sent for Captain Buonaparte in order to tell him he'd just discovered a position from which he claimed a battery of between 6 to 12 pieces would infallibly win Toulon in a few days. He was enraged at Napoleon's rebuttal of the idea, who observed that if a battery could command every point, it also followed that every point would be able to fire at it, and that their 12 guns would have 150 enemy guns to oppose them. When the Commandant of the Engineer Department also agreed with Napoleon, Carto merely remarked that it was impossible to do anything with these learned corps, as they were all in league with each other. Carteau was infuriated by Napoleon's independent line, but even Carteau's own wife took Napoleon's side. She told her husband, Let the young man alone. He knows more about it than you do, for he never asked your advice. Besides, are you not the responsible person? The glory will be yours. And later she told her husband, Do not reckon on him. That young man has too much understanding to remain long as saint culotte Carteau replied, Would you make us all out to be fools then? No, I did not say that, my dear, she replied, but I must tell you, he is not one of your sort. Napoleon set to work with a will. Success at Toulon depended on more than analytical and strategic skills. It required tact, the ability to systematically impose oneself 
amid a profusion of competing plans, requests, voices and needs, knowing who to contact among various military and political authorities and how and when to apply the pressure, and how to effectively oppose indecision, timidity, confusion and incompetence among individuals who were often far superior in rank and age to him without getting himself sacked or treated with contempt. Napoleon found himself with few cannon, not enough trained gun crews, and a shortage of gunpowder and shot. Deploring the confusion and waste, Napoleon despaired that the provisioning of arms is no more than luck. He sent officers further afield to other French towns, and requested that the army of Italy provide him with unused cannon from the citadels of Monaco and Antibes. Napoleon requisitioned horses, got draft oxen from as far as Montpellier, organized brigades of wagoners to bring 100,000 sacks of earth for fortifications, employed basket makers and constructed an arsenal of 80 forges, as well as workshops for repairing muskets. He sent scores of letters, constantly imploring, complaining and raging. There was not enough gunpowder, the cartridges were the wrong size, trained artillery horses were being requisitioned from him for other uses. Napoleon wrote, one can remain for 24 or if necessary 36 hours without eating but one cannot remain three minutes without gunpowder. As the guns arrived, Napoleon dug them in on the sea edge and began pounding the English fleet. His bombardments were so successful that four days after he took command, the English noted that their gunboats suffered considerably and that their shipping was under threat. At Carteau's headquarters, however, some grumbled that Napoleon had gone too close, that gunners had been overexposed. When one of the representatives made some observation about the position of a battery, Look to your own business, Napoleon retorted, and leave me to follow mine. The battery must remain where it is. I will answer for its effect with my head. The effect of all his hectoring, bluster, requisitioning and political string pulling was that Napoleon put together a strong artillery force in very short order. Napoleon built the artillery up from a handful of men and five guns to 64 officers, 1,600 men and nearly 100 cannon. Salicetti was soon reporting to the government in Paris that Buonaparte was the only officer of the artillery who knows anything of his duty, and he has too much work. He was wrong about the second part. For Napoleon, there would never seem to be such a thing as too much work. Napoleon soon learned that he had been promoted to major, despite grumbles from Carteau's headquarters that he was a dirty aristocrat. Jealous of the ascendancy that Napoleon, or Captain Cannon as he nicknamed him, was gaining daily, Carteau now denied Napoleon the infantry support he needed to move his batteries forward. The siege came to a standstill. Napoleon then asked the government commissioners to appoint a senior officer over him to command the artillery, who if only by his rank will carry weight with the crowd of ignoramuses at headquarters. Napoleon's request was granted, but the general was elderly and unwell, and Napoleon had de facto command of the artillery throughout the entire siege. Napoleon showed considerable personal bravery in the batteries and redoubts of Toulon, exposing himself to so much enemy fire that several horses were shot from under him. At one point, he picked up a blood-soaked ramrod from an artilleryman who had been killed by his side, loading and firing the gun himself in a great morale boost to the soldiers. By now, Napoleon had his own staff of officers, and it was here that he was to form early friendships with comrades who were to become famous able men such as Marmont, who was now a major. A shrewd and self-assured young man, Marmont came from a good family and a dark good looks and an easy manner that won him many friends. Marmont stuck closely to Napoleon, making him the first to hitch himself to his fortunes. Of Napoleon in his younger days, Marmont recalled, I found his ideas far above any that I had ever encountered in my life. When we were alone, he talked with such a thorough grasp of things and with such infinite charm. There was also Duroc, charming, talented, loyal. He and Napoleon would form an unbreakable, lifelong bond. Duroc appreciated him for himself, but also knew how to tell Napoleon the truth at the proper moment. Napoleon said that he was the only man who truly shared his understanding and possessed his entire confidence. Another new face in Napoleon's staff was a young sergeant from Burgundy, Andoche Junot, later nicknamed the Storm. The circumstances which brought him and Napoleon together at Toulon were especially heroic. Someone was needed to reconnoitre the English trenches, and Napoleon asked for an officer who was audacious and intelligent. Junot was recommended. Take off your uniform, put this one on, and carry this order over there, Napoleon said to him, pointing to the spot in the distance. Junot reddened and his eyes flashed. I'm not a spy, he replied. Find someone else to execute such an order. 
You refuse to obey, said Napoleon. I am ready to obey, but I will go in my own uniform or not go at all. That is honour enough for these Englishmen. But they will kill you. What is that to you? You don't know me well enough to fret after me. And as for myself, it is all the one to me. Well, I may go as I am, may I not? Juno then put his hand into his cartridge box. Well, with my sword and these bullets, at any rate, the conversation will not flag, if those fellows have anything to say to me. Junot then set off towards the English trenches, singing. A few days later, Napoleon asked for someone from the ranks with good handwriting to report to him. Junot offered, and sat down next to the battery of cannons to write out the order. Junot had barely finished his task, when an English shell landed just a few feet away from them, and covered them and the order papers with earth. Good, Juno rebuked coolly. I shall not need any sand to dry the ink. A quip that made Napoleon smile. He loved gestures of sheer courage, and nothing rattled Juno. Young man, what can I do for you? he asked. To which Juno promptly replied, Everything. Then, gesturing to his shoulder with his hand, he added, You can change this worsted into an epaulette. Napoleon dug in a group of cannon dangerously close to the fort. The battery of men without fear, he proudly christened it. But the position was so overexposed that many soldiers refused to be sent there. Napoleon had them gathered and gave them a speech. I am going to create a battery of fearless men. I need men, real men, men with guts, certainly not sissies. I would never ask them to take an enemy position, but I insist that they follow me to that position. If you are one of these men, raise your hand. They all raised their hands then lifted both arms into the air and shouted, Vive Bonaparte! Napoleon knew how to talk to men, even at this early stage. He knew how to transform cowardly privates, perpetually dissatisfied with their fate, into pure hard soldiers, proud of their lot, however miserable the circumstances. For two days, he and his men fought an artillery duel with the enemy. In November, the commissioners finally removed and threw into prison General Carteau, whose attacks in Column of Three were proving ruinous. They replaced him with Dope, a dentist, who was a humble man conscious of his limitations, which included, surprisingly, a horror of blood. A few days later, during an attack on an English-held fort which was on the point of succeeding, Dope saw one of his aides cut in two by a cannonball before his very eyes. Sickened, he panicked and gave the signal for the retreat, crying out, Stop! Turn back! I won't see any more! Two days later, he resigned. After this failed attack on the fort, Napoleon turned to the redoubt and swore, our blow at Toulon was missed because, uh, has beaten the retreat. Though the admiration was clearly not mutual, Dope sung the praises of young Bonaparte. He was extraordinarily active and demonstrated an uncommon degree of fearlessness. He was always with his men, and if he needed a moment's rest, he took it lying on the ground, wrapped in his cloak. He never left his batteries. Napoleon had viewed all the ridiculous episodes so far with the utmost frustration, but at last a professional soldier arrived to take command, General Dugommier, aged 55, a former sugar planter. He and Napoleon took to each other at once. Napoleon told Dugommier his plan for capturing Toulon, and afterwards Dugommier remarked, There is only one possible plan, Buonaparte's. On the 30th of November, the English tried to seize back the initiative. They attacked the French batteries en masse and tried to spike their guns. The French counter-attacked and drove the English back, during which skirmish, Napoleon personally captured the English commander-in-chief, General O'Hara. Only 12 years earlier, General O'Hara had been forced to surrender to George Washington during the American War of Independence, and now he got to surrender to Napoleon Bonaparte too. He ran out of the battery and advanced towards us, Napoleon recalled. He was wounded by the fire of a sergeant, and I who stood at the mouth of the boyo seized him by the coat and threw him back amongst my own men, thinking he was a colonel. While they were taking him to the back, he cried out that he was the commander-in-chief of the English. He thought they were going to massacre him, as there existed a horrible order at that time from the convention to give no quarter to the English. I ran up and prevented the soldiers from ill-treating him, and I saw that he thought they intended to butcher him. I did everything in my power to console him, and gave orders that his wound should be immediately dressed and every attention paid to him. While captive, O'Hara recognised the value and courage of his captors, and turning to Napoleon, allegedly remarked, that with an army of soldiers like these, you could conquer the world. At last, all was ready for the grand attempt on Fort Mulgrave. On the evening of the 17th of December, 7,000 French troops gathered for the attack. 
Heavy rain was falling and a high wind shook the trees. These were demoralizing conditions and made accurate musket fire difficult. Dugomier, who reckoned that even in good weather, half of his troops were unreliable, he told his staff that he wanted to postpone the attack until the next day. But the commissioners, led by Salicetti, got to hear of this. They were already suspicious of Dugomier's political purity. The commissioners came to Napoleon, told him that they wanted an immediate attack, and offered him Dugomier's command. It was a key moment for Napoleon, one of those testing situations he had described in his essays and stories when a man must choose between personal glory or comradeship. Napoleon did not hesitate. He replied that he had complete confidence in Dugomier, whom he respected and admired, and would not accept the command. Then he went to talk to Dugomier himself, informed him of what had happened, argued that rain would not prevent victory, which depended on cannons and bayonets anyway, and successfully convinced him that an immediate attack could save the revolution. Dugomier placed himself at the head of 5,000 men, leaving Napoleon in the reserve with 2,000. While Napoleon's guns battered the enemy, the French advanced with fixed bayonets and quickly captured two outposts. Then they came under heavy gunfire from Fort Mulgrave. Dozens of French troops fell and the rest took flight. They began to turn back, but Dugomier managed to rally them and they charged the double war fort. Twice they hurled themselves against the spike outer palisades and twice they were driven back. Then Dugomier ordered Napoleon to leave the reserves to attack. Mounting his horse, Napoleon led his 2,000 men through the torrential rain towards the fort. Almost at once his horse was shot from under him, and he continued the rest of the way on foot. He felt calm. His theory was, if your number's up, there's no point in worrying. He and his men arrived at the fort's walls. Muskets slung, sabres between their teeth, they clambered over the spiked timber and blockades climbing on one another's shoulders and slithered through the gun recesses. They went for the English and Piedmontese with sabre, pike and ramrod in close hand-to-hand -hand combat. Napoleon seemed to be everywhere, inspiring the onset, even more reckless of his own life than those of the soldiers he was commanding. In the heat of the battle, Napoleon was wounded. He received a deep thrust from an English sergeant's pike in his left inner thigh, just above the knee. His boot filled with blood and he fell backwards, but was caught by Lieutenant Muron, who bore him to safety, and from then on Napoleon treated him like a brother. This would be the only serious wound that Napoleon ever received in battle. But he would not rest, and insisted on returning to the fight. For a long time, the result hung in the balance. Napoleon's mangled, bleeding columns rushed in the embrasure of the rampart. Again and again the French were repelled, only to return to the assault, after a couple of hours bitter fighting, at three in the morning, the fort at last fell. In the course of a few hours, 8,000 shells from Napoleon's gun batteries had been thrown into Little Gibraltar until the massive works were almost a pile of ruins. Napoleon, having accomplished his prime objective, now immediately prepared the French artillerymen to take over the cannons the English had left behind and began to bombard the nearby English forts and the fleet. General, Napoleon said to Dugomier, as the tricolor flag was raised over the walls of the crumbling fort, go and rest yourself, we have taken too long. You may sleep there the day after tomorrow. The next day, just as Napoleon had predicted, the neighboring English-held forts became panic-stricken. No sooner had they seen the tricolored flag floating from the parapets of Little Gibraltar then realising that the city was no longer defendable, they made a signal for the retreat to prepare for immediate evacuation. In the words of Sidney Smith, the retreat was pandemonium, and the English troops crowded to the water like a herd of swine that ran furiously into the sea, possessed of the devil. Sidney Smith tried to burn the arsenal and scuttle the French fleet, in the process inadvertently blowing up two British gunboats. That evening, under the cover of night, the English ships slipped out to sea taking as many French ships as possible. The rest, 15 ships of the line and eight frigates, were collected to be burned. A fire ship filled with combustibles was towed into their midst, and at 10 p.m. the torch was applied. The flames of the burning ships burst like an inferno from the center of the harbor, while the water was covered with boats, crowded with French royalists, hurrying frantically to the English and Spanish ships, though many had to be left to their fate, or were drowned in the chaos. The next day, the French troops entered Toulon. The victory had been won. Toulon had been liberated, and everyone was looking to congratulate Napoleon and carry him off in triumph. He, however, 
apparently uninterested, was sleeping in the rain with a drum for a pillow, wrapped under his cloak, resting his injured leg. It had become septic. At first, the doctors had wanted to amputate it, but after a second examination, they changed their mind. Toulon was a milestone for Napoleon. He had shown that he could be trusted with command. He had his first taste of real battle, and it is noteworthy that it was fought to drive English invaders off of French soil. Whereas the carnage at the Tuileries had sickened him, here he had kept his sensibilities in check, and even given proof of toughness, an essential quality in a first-rate officer. The recapture of the town was a very important victory. It expelled the combined forces of four nations from French soil, and it ended the rebellion in the south of France. Toulon even became the subject of patriotic songs and plays, and Dugomier wrote of him to the Minister of War, I have no words to describe Bonaparte's merit. Much technical skill, an equal degree of intelligence, and too much gallantry. There you have a poor sketch of this rare officer. <laughs> Meanwhile, once Toulon had been captured, the government commissioners, including Freron and Paul Barat, had orders from the Committee of Public Safety to wreak national vengeance on all the people of Toulon who were suspected of handing over the city to the English. After nights of courage came days of cruelty. One day, 200 men and officers of the naval artillery were shot on order of the representatives. Two days later, a further 200 men and women were shot without trial. There was an old merchant, age 84, deaf and almost blind. In spite of his age and infirmities, the tribunal pronounced him guilty of conspiracy. His real crime was being worth 18 million francs. To save himself, he offered to give up the majority of his wealth to the tribunal but this offer was rejected, and he was sentenced to the scaffold. At the sight of the inhuman execution of this old man, said Napoleon, I felt as if the end of the world was at hand. Dugomier tried to stop the bloodshed, but got a bad name with the commissioners and resigned his command. Napoleon, able to limp about, also did what he could to protect the helpless inhabitants from the fury. Napoleon learnt that the de Chabrillan family had been imprisoned by fanatical revolutionaries for no other reason than their noble birth but the mob believed they were fleeing the country to join the emigres and the allied armies in the march against Paris, and so they seized the hated aristocrats to hang them from the nearest lamppost. Among the rioters, Napoleon spotted several gunners who had served under him during the siege. Their respect for him secured him a hearing. Napoleon persuaded them to entrust the family to him, assuring them that they would be tried and sentenced the next morning. At midnight, he placed the family in an artillery wagon, concealed among barrels of powder and casks of bullets, and had them smuggled out of the city to safety. Had their absence been discovered, Citizen Buonaparte may well have taken their place on the guillotine block. Not long after Toulon had been retaken, Napoleon took his 15-year-old brother, Louis, to inspect the old siege works. As Napoleon showed him the site of one of Carteau's failed attacks, and the earth mounds where the dead soldiers were buried, he turned to his little brother and said, Look, young man, let this be a lesson to you, that for a soldier, it is as much a matter of conscience as wisdom to study one's profession seriously. If the wretch who sent these brave men into attack had known his job, a great many of them would still be alive and serving the Republic. His ignorance sent them to their deaths, them, and hundreds like them, in the flower of their youth, and at the very moment when they were about to achieve fame and happiness. According to Louis, Napoleon grew emotional as he spoke, and tears came to his eyes. On the 22nd of December, 1793, Napoleon was promoted to Brigadier General. He had risen from the rank of Captain in just four months. However, there was a dark side to the picture. Napoleon possessed authority, but that could be dangerous under a government resentful of all authority but its own. Napoleon was a moderate, but that could be dangerous in an age of extremists. Napoleon was now a Brigadier, but that could be dangerous if you got on the wrong side of the government commissioner, as Dugomier had done. Like anyone else in the public eye, Napoleon would be walking a tightrope from here on in. His pay was now a substantial 15,000 livres a year, and he at once set about looking after his family. Letizia had not been happy living in Marseille, where the family's gloomy, ill-furnished four-floor rooms were situated in a poor district little better than a slum. Corsica had not always provided well for the Bonapartes, but at the old casa there had at least been garden produce, eggs and the fruit of the orchard. Letizia missed her homeland, and her disjointed French, spoken with a strong Corsican accent, was scarcely comprehensible. 
while eyebrows had been raised, a malicious story spread about her daughter's flirtatious behaviour. When Napoleon rejoined them, he learned of the hardships they had endured in his absence. He embraced Letizia, assuring her, Mother, all this is over. I shall bring you food and money, and find you more decent lodging. Napoleon moved them from the poverty of Marseille to a superb villa, Chateau Salé, in the exquisite neighbourhood of Antibes, surrounded by palms, eucalyptus, mimosa and orange trees. Although Napoleon hired servants for her, Letizia, ever the Corsican with her high standards of cleanliness, insisted on doing the washing herself in a sparkling little stream which ran near the end of the garden. As usual, the one member of his family he was worried about was Lucien. Although the least good-looking of the Bonaparte brothers, his charm, when he chose to use it, was overwhelming. But Lucien was one of those angry young Republicans who believed only in levelling down. To demonstrate his independence, Lucien secretly married Christine Boyer, a pretty and kind brunette, but she was illiterate and poor, an innkeeper's daughter, and though he was underage, Lucien had not asked Letizia's permission and faked his birth certificate. So much, he seemed to be saying, for the noble Bonapartes. Letizia resigned herself to the match, but when Napoleon heard of the marriage he was furious. As he was doing his utmost to build up his family's financial and social position, Lucien could not brook authority, and he resented the lead Napoleon took in the family. To Joseph, Lucien confided, I feel in myself the courage to become a tyrannicide. I write with astonishing speed. My pen flies and then I scratch it all out. I correct little. I do not like the rules that limit genius and do not observe any. In the same spirit, Lucien composed grandiloquent speeches, which would soon get him into trouble with the authorities. They were not to Napoleon's taste. Too many words and not enough ideas. You can't speak like that to the ordinary man on the street. He has more common sense and tact than you think. Soon after the capture of Toulon, Napoleon accompanied Dugomier to Marseille. Someone asked Dugomier, gesturing towards Napoleon, who is that little bit of an officer and where did you find him? That officer's name is Napoleon Bonaparte. I picked him up at the siege of Toulon, to the successful termination of which he eminently contributed. And you will probably one day see that this little bit of an officer is a greater man than any of us. Also in Marseille were the Clary family, textile millionaires, with royalist sympathies, for which one brother, to escape being shot, committed suicide, while the other was thrown into prison. Later, Napoleon's brother, Joseph, managed to get this brother released from prison. The grateful Clary family befriended Joseph and often invited him to their luxurious house. And when Napoleon went to Marseille, he was invited to visit the family there too. My brother, Napoleon. We were all so glad that you could come, Citizen General. It was not difficult. I had nowhere else to go. My, uh, my brother means, of course, that no one else had been kind enough to invite... What I mean is that after hearing Joseph tell of your charming daughters, I could have gone nowhere else, Madame Clary. There were two young daughters in the Clary household, Julie, aged 22, and the youngest daughter, Desiree, aged 16. Both were brunettes with big brown eyes. Desiree's portraits show her as sultry rather than beautiful though quite pretty enough to attract the fixed and melancholy gaze of Bonaparte. Napoleon enjoyed listening to the girls singing, and Desiree seems to have had a good voice. The first thing Napoleon tended to notice in a woman was her hands, which tied in with another quality he liked, femininity. He liked a woman with a tender, gentle nature and a soft voice, someone he could protect. Finally, he would also look for sincerity and depth of feeling. He began to become extremely fond of the millionaire's shy musical daughter. At home, everyone called her Desiree, but Napoleon did not care for that name, with its suggestion of physical desire, and when they were alone, he called her by her middle name, Eugenie, which he thought more refined. This private name, along with their passion for music, became a special link between them. Napoleon described Eugenie in a romantic short story he penned, not long afterwards. Eugenie, without being plain, was not a beauty, but she was good, sweet, lively and tender. She never looked boldly at a man. She smiled sweetly. If you gave her your hand, she gave her shyly, and only for a moment, almost teasingly showing the prettiest hand in the world, where the whiteness of the skin contrasted with blue veins, whereas her sister was like a piece of French music, the chords and harmony of which everyone enjoys. Eugenie was like the Nightingale's song, or a piece by Paciello, which only sensitive people enjoy. It appears mediocre to the average listener, but its melody transports and excites to passion those who possess intense feelings. 
Other opinions about Eugenie vary. One writer described her as rather pretty, a great coquette, and very frivolous. Is it true that Robespierre has forbidden dancing in the streets and has closed all the houses of pleasure in Paris? Yes, Please forgive my sister. Sometimes Your she does Your sister not has the happy faculty of saying the first thing that comes into her mind. She's without guile, a quality almost unbelievable in the moment. Despite the young officer's gloom, her sister liked and flirted with him, whereas shy Eugenie at first felt a strong aversion to him, which she could neither explain nor justify to herself. You were staring at me in the parlor. What were you staring at? Your uniform. I didn't think a general could be so shabby. You must be very poor. She fixed her eyes on the strangers and never tired of secretly gazing at him. What is his background? How somber and thoughtful he seems. His glance reveals the maturity of old age, his countenance the languor of adolescence. Have you ever heard of Destiny Desiree? The impressionable young Desiree, in this short period of time, fell in love with the young general. Napoleon knew that his brother Joseph was fond of both Clary girls, but preferred Desiree and thought of marrying her. Napoleon took his brother aside. In a happy marriage, he reasoned, one person has to yield to the other. Now you're not strong-minded, nor is Desiree, or as Julie and I know what we want. You'd better marry Julie, and Desiree will be my wife. And now which one of your two ladies will be kind enough to show me your girl? Joseph had no objections. If his brother, the brigadier, preferred Desiree, then he, in his easy-going way, was prepared to stand down. Joseph began to court the flirtatious Julie. Her plainness and slightly misshapen figure were more than offset in the eyes of the handsome and debonair Joseph by her huge dowry of a hundred thousand livres. By contrast, Joseph had nothing, but he had saved her brother's life. Both mothers gave their consent, and in August, Julie became Joseph's wife. To the Bonapartes, it must have seemed as if he had wedded a gold mine, and it did help ease their financial worries. They led a happy life together, notwithstanding the womanizing Joseph's many extramarital affairs. But before Napoleon could get to know Desiree better, or even attempt to court her. He was posted to the Army of the Alps in 1794, where he fought against the Austrians. His first letter to Desiree was somewhat tepid. Your unfailing sweetness and the lively openness which is yours alone inspire me with affection, dear Eugenie. But I am so occupied by work that I don't think this affection ought to cut into my soul and leave a deeper scar. This reveals a conflict between feeling and duty, heart and head which was to be characteristic of Napoleon's relationships with women. Despite the new Republican informality, he still insisted on addressing her as Vu. In the same letter, he compliments her, saying that she was gifted for music and urged her to buy a piano and engage a good teacher. Music is the soul of love. Still, he kept up his pursuit, writing to her later that same month, the charms of your character and person have won over the heart of your lover. To increase the charms of her intellect, he sent her a list of books he recommended her to read. He also urged her to improve her memory and form her reason. Toulon, that is Mademoiselle. I'm sure you've heard of it, have you not? Sometimes my ignorance is beyond belief. Though Napoleon was not avant-garde enough to see women as men's equals, he had the clear idea that they should be educated. He asked Desiree of the effect of her reading on her soul and tried to encourage her to think of music intellectually. However, in camp, where the only music was fife and drum, Napoleon probably became aware of the many differences between himself and his young sweetheart in Marseille, including the nine-year age difference, and they went out of touch for five months. Indeed, Desiree can't have made that deep an impression on him. While with the army of Nice, Napoleon got to know General Dumberion and his pretty and strong-willed wife, who shared and sometimes even usurped his authority. I was, Napoleon recalled, very young when I first knew this lady. I was proud of the favourable impression I had made on her, and seized every opportunity of showing her all the attention in my power. I will mention one circumstance, to show for what trivialities sometimes causes men to abuse the authority on which the fate of their fellow creatures depends, for I am no worse than the rest. I was walking about one day with a representative's wife, inspecting our positions in the neighbourhood of Col de Tonde, when I suddenly took it into my head to give her an idea of a battle, and for this purpose ordered the attack of an advanced post. We were the victors, it is true, but the affair could be attended by no advantage. The attack was a mere whim, and yet it cost the lives of several men. 
I have never failed to reproach myself whenever I look back on this affair. Meanwhile, the terror had reached its climax. 1,300 people went to the guillotine in two months, with one third of them not even receiving the semblance of a trial. The guillotining of the extremist Abertiste faction in March and of Danton and Desmoulins on the 5th of April showed the revolution remorselessly devouring its own children. An eyewitness noted thousands of women and children sitting on the stones in front of the baker's shops and more than half of Paris living on potatoes. Paper money was without value. The city was ripe for a reaction against the Jacobins, who had so clearly failed to deliver either food or peace. Eventually, a group of conventionnels, partly sickened by the carnage, partly in self-defense, accused Maximilien Robespierre of conspiring against the revolution, whereupon his brother, Augustin, leapt to his feet to defend him. I have shared his virtues, and I intend to share his fate, he declared. Next day, both Robespierre brothers were guillotined, along with 60 other terrorists, and the Thermidorians took over, ending the reign of terror. Napoleon had just returned from his brother Joseph's wedding when he heard of the Robespierre's fate. At the Siege of Toulon, Napoleon had met and become friendly with Augustin Robespierre, who was quite different in character to his older brother. He was affable, nicknamed Bonbon, and travelled around with his pretty mistress. Augustin had been so impressed by Napoleon that he had written to his brother Maximilian in Paris that he was an officer of transcendent merit. He is a man who resisted Paoli's caresses and who saw his property wrecked by this traitor. Augustin had even urged Napoleon to accompany him when he went back to Paris. And had Napoleon not firmly resisted, he may well have been scooped up and sent to the guillotine with them. When Napoleon heard of Augustin's death, I have been somewhat moved by the fate of the younger Robespierre, he wrote, whom I liked and believed honest. But had he been my own brother, if he had aspired to tyranny, I'd have stabbed him myself. Everyone close to either of the Robespierre brothers was now a suspect, among them Salicetti. From unknown motives, perhaps self-preservation, Salicetti did nothing to protect Napoleon from the political fallout, and indeed, suddenly turned on him. In a letter to the government, Salicetti declared that Napoleon had previously gone on a highly suspicious journey to Genoa. A warrant was issued. General Napoleon, one of our party? Yes. We went first to your barracks, sir. They told us we could find you here. Warrant for the arrest of Citizen General Bonaparte. Napoleon found himself under house arrest in his BA in Nice, guarded by ten gendarmes. His papers were ransacked, sealed, and sent to Salicetti for examination to secure evidence of treachery. Napoleon was then moved to be actually imprisoned in Fort Carré in Antibes. Almost any wrong phrase at this time was enough to send a suspect to the guillotine, and Napoleon was in grave danger, but he remained calm, doubtless applying his battlefield philosophy. In his confinement, he revealed himself an optimist. He spent his time reading and taking notes of the campaigns in Piedmont, but in reality, his position was so dire that his friends, Marmont and the loyal but impulsive Junot, proposed a scheme to help him escape. Napoleon tried to dissuade them from this in the following letter. I see a strong proof of your friendship, my dear Junot, in the proposition you make to me, and I trust you feel convinced that the friendly sentiments that I have long entertained for you remained unabated. Men may be unjust towards me, but it is enough for me to know that I am innocent. My conscience is the tribunal before which I try my conduct. That conscience is calm when I question it. Do not, therefore, stir in this business. You will only compromise me. Adieu, my dear Junot. Yours, Bonaparte. Napoleon also wrote a letter of protest to Salicetti. You have relieved me from my duty and ordered me under arrest. You have branded me without a sentence or sentenced me without a hearing. Have I not, ever since the revolution began, constantly shown my devotion to the right principles? I abandoned my belongings. I lost everything for the sake of the Republic. Since then, I have served at Toulon with some distinction. Since Robespierre's conspiracy was discovered, my conduct has been that of a man accustomed to judge according to principles, not persons. No one can deny me the title of patriot. 
Napoleon later resentfully commented, Salicetti barely deigned to look at me from the lofty heights of his greatness. Salicetti has done me a grievous injury. He broke my career just as it was opening out. He withered my ideas of glory on their stem. That man is an evil genius. No, I can forgive, but not forget. That is another matter. Napoleon wrote another letter to the representatives. Citizens, herewith you will find my replies to your four questions. Since appearing to have forfeited the esteem of free men, my conscience enables me to remain calm, but my heart is torn, and I feel that, with a cool head but a warm heart, I cannot endure a life that is under the cloud of suspicion. Salicetti and his colleagues examined Napoleon's papers and found them in order, including his trip to Genoa, which had been to inspect fortifications. But Napoleon had still been friendly with Augustin, a declared enemy of the state. He had written a Jacobin tract, Le Super du Bucaire, and he bore an Italian name. When France was at war with the Italian states, the commissioners turned their eyes to Paris, and there, doubtless to their surprise, they found that there was no further demand for blood. A week later, the commissioners wrote that having found nothing to justify their suspicions, they decreed that citizen Bonaparte be provisionally released. An officer entering Napoleon's room a couple of hours after midnight to tell him this good news found Napoleon dressed and seated at his table with maps, books and charts spread out before him. What? Are you not in bed yet? In bed? I have had my sleep and am risen already. What? So early? Yes, so early. Two or three hours of sleep are enough for any man. After a fortnight's arrest, Napoleon stepped out into the Mediterranean sunshine. Shortly afterwards, his rank was restored, and when he later came to power, he would make his prison guard a palace adjutant. After five months preparing an expedition, in March 1795, Napoleon was among those who set sail for Marseille with 15 ships and nearly 17,000 men to recapture Corsica from Paoli and the British, but the plan was foiled and two French ships were captured, though Napoleon was not held personally responsible. At this time, Napoleon and Desiree got back in touch again. In his letters, the tone was now less personal, almost like an older brother, though he seems to have enjoyed her playful chastisement. If you could witness, mademoiselle, the sentiments with which your letter inspired me, you would be convinced of the injustice of your approaches. There is no pleasure in which I do not desire to include you, no dream of which you do not furnish half. Be certain, then, that the most sensitive of women loves the coldest of men is an iniquitous and ill-judged, unjust phrase, which you did not believe in the writing. Your heart disavowed it even as your hand wrote it. Writing to you is both my greatest pleasure and the most imperative need of my soul. Adieu, my good, beautiful and tender friend. Be cheerful and look after yourself. Napoleon was finally using the familiar two form. He returned to Marseille and after nine months separation he saw Eugenie again. She had evidently blossomed. She also sang better, perhaps as a result of his encouragement. Only a short time before, Napoleon had written in his notebook, Love is injurious to the individual happiness of man. The ivy twines its tendrils round the first tree it meets, and there, in brief, is love's story. But now, Napoleon fell in love. In his romantic novel, he later wrote of himself and Eugenie, During a walk in the woods, their eyes met, their hearts fused, and not many days were to pass before they realised that their hearts were made to love each other. His love was the most passionate and chaste that had ever moved a man's heart. They felt as if their souls were one. They overcame all obstacles and were joined forever. All that is most honourable in love, the tenderest feelings, the most exquisite voluptuousness, flooded the hearts of the two enraptured lovers. Sometime in the next two weeks, it seems Napoleon and Desiree consummated their relationship. On his deathbed, Napoleon would reveal that he once found Desiree in his room, hiding under his bed, and he confessed that he had taken her virginity. It is true that morals were more relaxed during this revolutionary period, but to take the innocence of a young girl and then not marry her was against Napoleon's old-fashioned code of honour. It was vastly different in the case of a woman who was worldly and experienced. And so the question of marriage was finally broached to Desiree's family. But she was still only 17, and with her dowry of 100,000 livres, had far more to offer than Napoleon, who only had his army pay. Desiree's mother, who had already given one daughter to penniless Joseph, allegedly opposed point-blank her daughter's wish to marry Napoleon, saying, One Bonaparte in my family is quite enough. 
but her mother's hostility did not shake their affection, and the couple made a tender pledge to each other and thought of themselves as unofficially engaged. But once again, politics was to intervene to mar Napoleon's happiness. At the end of April 1795, Napoleon received a letter from the War Office appointing him to command the artillery of the Army of the West, which was currently engaged in suppressing the royalist peasant uprisings in Brittany and the Vendée, a vicious and dirty war where more Frenchmen were killed than in the whole of the Paris Terror. Napoleon saw this letter as yet another misfortune. He had had enough of civil war. He wanted to shoot down no more fellow Frenchmen. Besides, he now considered himself, with good reason, an expert on the Alpine frontier. This posting would take him far away from the army of Italy, where he had made a reputation, away from the territory he was familiar with, and his friends, family, not to mention his new fiancée. Napoleon decided he must hurry to Paris with his three aides de camp, Junot, Marmont and Miron, to get the appointment overruled, which meant he had to say goodbye to Desiree. As soon as he had left, Desiree wrote him a tear-stained letter. Take care of your life, in order to preserve that of your Desiree, who could not live without you. Keep the vow that you have made to me, even as I shall keep mine to you. The hour for our walk approaches, but my friend is not here to find me. Ah, how I regret that we have to be apart. Each instant that you are far from me pierces my heart. Napoleon wrote to her, You are always in my thoughts. Remembrances and love from one who is yours for life. However, his stay in Paris was to prove the most eventful one yet. When Napoleon returned to Marseille a year later, he would be married, but not to Desiree.